Greetings, everyone. I hope you are well. Before we get started, I have a special announcement to make. When this channel hits 5,000 subscribers, one of you will become the lucky winner of $100. The only requirements are, you must be a subscriber to Back to Ashes and to my horror channel, Phoenix Fire Narrations. More details to come. Down below, you can find the link to the merch store for Back to Ashes and Phoenix Fire Narrations. Also, you can buy me a coffee if you'd like, if you are enjoying what you are hearing. You can also become a member of Back to Ashes for only $1.99 a month. You will get early access to videos, and you will get a special shout out in every single video, plus many more perks. Now, let's get you that dose of vocal melatonin that you always crave. It is time to go back to ashes, for when we go to the ashes, we arise a bigger, brighter, and happier person in the morning. Tuck in, get comfortable, and let's get started with these true backwoods creepy stories. I used to often spend my summers bouldering with my friends by a relatively large forest that was about an hour and a half away from where I used to live. We used to spend some of the nights camping out there just to save some travel cost and time. Anyway, I think this was roughly like the third or fourth time we were out there camping. My friend had left all her climbing gear and her rucksack just outside her tent, or we definitely think she did anyway. The next morning, we found her boots, a few clothes, and all her chalk powder had disappeared. We figured that it could have been completely feasible that she misplaced it, although we were quite sure that they were next to her tent. We didn't really want to believe that they were stolen. We didn't read too much into this and just stupidly said to ourselves that perhaps she had left it by the boulders and some animal took an interest to it. I know it sounds stupid, but it was very reasonable to us at the time. Anyway... Fast forward a year, we're at the same spot as usual, sitting by the tents and chilling after having some food. Mind you, it's pitch black out, and only the camp area is lit by the fire. I go somewhere a bit out of sight for a slash and what do I see? A dude in a full-on ghillie suit, laying on his stomach, looking right towards our campsite. I kinda stood there frozen as this dude clocks that. I've seen him, and he just bolts it out of there. We didn't know how long he had been laying out there spying on us, but one thing is for certain, we will definitely be picking a different campsite in the near future. This actually happened to me when I was a fair bit younger, but a while back, I was solo backpacking on an unfamiliar, but really lush, kind of twisty little backcountry trail. I was using a lot of gear I had made from natural stuff, and it was early summer, so I didn't have any hunting licenses, and I didn't have a gun or anything with me. Literally just a short kelp I had made and a couple flint knives. I had had a really nice couple of days of my trip and I was encountering nothing but pleasant weather, peace and quiet, and nature in all its glory. Then, on the third day, after I broke for lunch, I noticed movement on the trail behind me. I was carrying a lot of weight in a homemade triangle frame pack as a strength building exercise, and I wasn't going all that fast. I thought at first it was a hiker, so I made a little effort to slow down to let them pass, but they never seemed to catch up. Eventually, that started to become irritating, and that was when I started to notice the movement just off the trail behind me. It was staying behind trees and bushes and around bends, and I couldn't make out what it was. Its silhouette was indistinct, and it was staying behind cover couldn't get a square look at it, but the more I looked at it, the more it looked wrong. The torso was weird, too long, no waist, 
and I couldn't make sense of the glimpses I got of the head. The legs were extremely spindly, and the arms were hunched up or something, or tinted in front of it. This was mostly on clay, and trails can be hard-packed ground on clay, almost drum-like. Sometimes you can really hear the thump of a footstep, but these were just erratic and so loud, like slamming a stick down onto the dirt. I called out to it a few times, let it know the time for jokes was over, knock it off a few times. Whenever I spoke or yelled, it would just get quiet. Every once in a while, there would be a crashing sound from back around where I heard it and a bunch of thumps, and I kept thinking it was charging at me, but then nothing, and a while later, I'd hear it again from a ways back. This lasted the full rest of the day, and by the time I was breaking for camp, I was starting to be pretty freaked out and pissed off. It was quite a while. I set up my tarp and got settled and as dark fell. I threw some stones behind me, mostly to settle my nerves, and it was silent, so I figured whatever it was, was over. When I cooked my food, I heard a few very rapid, very loud thumps from a ways behind me, and then silence. I was frozen over my dinner for a few seconds, and I could feel my heartbeat in my eyeballs. I looked back and put my flashlight beam through the bushes for a few moments and then pretty high, like taller than I was expecting to look for eyes. I saw two retinas reflect back up and then a bunch of thumps and crashing and a weird gasping, whistling breathing sound. But like it was going into a big space and a big chest, kind of high pitched. From the distance, I kind of heard a gagging cough. I didn't get any sleep that night. I just sat with my back to a big tree and with means of defending myself in my lap. I was not feeling good in the morning, but coffee got me up and running, and I didn't see or hear any more signs of it for a few hours. I had been going west, kind of at an angle to the wind, and the trail I had to switch to started going north with the wind on my back. That was when I started to smell something awful, and I realized that I must be smelling it because it persisted no matter how long I walked. It was rancid. Rotting flesh or something equally gag-inducing, paired with a kind of musky stink. I've got a strong sense of smell, very strong, and it was making it hard to breathe. Not too long after I smelled that, I started to hear the rustling behind me again and the weird, loud, faltering footsteps. I still had no idea what it was. I kept getting glimpses of it, but couldn't make out color or anything definite. Could have been gray or brown or patches of reddish brown. Never got a clear enough look at it. I was really freaked out at this point and I decided stupidly to charge at it a little to see if it would take off. I stomped and rushed the bushes a little, and I heard the rapid thumps and crashing again, and then silence again for a while. I am not ashamed to admit that it had freaked me out for long enough, that I decided it was just time to put distance between me and it, and I took off down the trail at a fair jog despite the weight of my pack. I got clear of the stink for a bit, and well, I had run too hard and my body decided it was a great time to vomit, so I did. I took a breather for a while, and then started to really drag ass to my next watering spot, a little brook, and it was no fun at all. Took me most of the day to get there, and I ended up skipping lunch because I didn't want to stop. I ended up deciding to set up camp closer to the water than I usually do. I was determined to get some sleep, but still freaked out, so I decided to do something 
I wouldn't normally do, and I set my hammock up really, really high, like around four or five feet off the ground, with my feet a little lower than my body so I could roll out and land on them. I ate my food as quickly as I could and then climbed, best as I could, into my hammock and tried to be as still as I could. I started to doze off almost immediately. An important detail is that I keep my pack on another tree with my poncho over it and my bear locker in a food bag even further away hanging in a tree. It had been drizzling for a few hours at that point. I don't know how long I slept before I was woken up by this bizarre, plasticky drumming sound. Really, really loud. Paired with the bizarre thumping and weird breathing, and the stench was back, big time. It took me a moment to come to, and then I was in full fight or flight mode. The noise was so weird. I had one of those little inflatable lanterns hanging off my hammock, so I flicked it on and I could kind of vaguely see around me, the bushes and stuff. As soon as the light went on, the noises all stopped. Silence, long enough for crickets to start up their bullcrap again. Then rapid steps and the thing popped through the foliage into the little area I had set up my tarp and hammock and I could see it more clearly for the first time. It was long torsoed and thin-legged and moved lurchingly. A weird, too big of a head apparently pierced through with a branch or something in lolling. Arms apparently outstretched in front of it and I could see its eyes reflecting back at me. Greenish yellow. I got that much of a glance and dropped down to the ground on my bare feet with my hatchet in hand. When I looked back up, I finally recognized it. It was a mule deer bug, covered in sores and dirt and deathly thin, stumbling around on its hind legs and going from tree to tree, snapping at leaves or something that wasn't there. Its breathing was super ragged and weird, and its head was beady floppy on its neck, and as it got closer to me, it fell down, making the crashing sound it had made before, and then struggled back up. When it noticed me, it froze. It peed a bunch, and then took off into the bushes. I would have laughed if I hadn't been so relieved and tired. I went to inspect my food bag, and it looked like I hadn't tied it well enough or high enough, as it was down, leaning against the trunk of the tree. It had had the ever-living crap kicked out of it. There were bent and scuffed bits all over my bear locker. I figure it must have had CWD or something, but Christ, did that thing mess with me. I marked a few spots with Arix pushed into the mud so I could find the tracks in the morning, dried off and slept for a few hours. I ended up searching around the place for a while in the morning, and it had already been muddy as I was putting up my shelter. Here's the thing. I found deer prints from where it had come in and left, but outside my clearing, from the direction I had heard it coming, I only found one print, a lot smaller than my feet. I'm a size 11 and flat-footed, with a high arch and only three toes, and it was in deep, deeper than my prints. No other tracks that I could find. I caught the rotting meat smell a few more times on the way back. I was supposed to go two days further in and then turn around, and I decided to just head back to my car. I actually heard the thumping as I was getting back to where I parked, and I ended up hustling the rest of the way. I haven't hiked on that trail since, if I'm being honest. There are some other weird aspects of it that I don't know if I want to get into, but one thing is for sure, I'm never hiking that trail again. I 
ahead of self-rescue I had to do in the Laramie Peak Range. I lost my gear and map and shelter in a windstorm. Took a few days to get out. Had some deeply unpleasant experiences along the way. This isn't that story. It sucked ass, but not all that scary. I kept a cool head. Typically, that's who I am. I'm the person who stays calm in crisis. And I mention that to give you a litmus test for what it takes to freak me out. To make me lose my cool. This is about a time when I had all my gear, but I couldn't keep my cool. There are a lot of cool little trails in Colorado. Some well known, some only locals know. There are mountains and forests for days out there. In 2013, we got a torrential downpour in September along the eastern slope. It was squelchy as crap for a while, and then a glorious, mushrooming boom happened. I love mushrooms. I love to forage, take one, leave three, and my absolute favorite is the Boletus ruberceps. The conditions weren't exactly right, but I thought, why not? I gave it a shot. I'm not saying where my spot is. Bald horses couldn't, etc., etc. I will say, I also have the native hazel there, some actually fruiting manzanita, watermelon berry, twist stalk, clasped leaf, currants, rose hips, raspberries, strawberries, and frequently oysters, morals, hawk wings, puff balls, the big ones in one meadow, milky caps, chicken of the woods, and chicken of the road, and the only chanterelles I've found in the region all in a glorious few acres. It's wonderful. I can disperse camp there. This is where I went, no brainer. Now it's fall, even if it's somewhat early fall, so I know that Yogi and Boo Boo are going to be out stuffing it for the winter. So I've got my spray and my uncle's Lever Action 44 Mag Henry. My girlfriend at the time was supposed to come with, but couldn't get off work, so solo it was. I figured I could practice some firecraft, maybe build a chair, maybe a smoker, and in general, just have a nice few days out. I went up early in the morning, hiked about seven miles, and set up my shelter. Set up to enjoy the rare luxury of a real fire in Colorado later, and started to do my stuff. Set up a couple rods with bells, got out my baskets, and set up my dryer and its shelter far away from my sleeping tarp shelter. I was squelching around with my foraging gear out in a few minutes and having a blast. I marched happily along pretty much until dusk, and then pulled out my headlamp and kept going well past, well, past later than I should have. But damn, did I get a haul. It was an incredible spread, and I left plenty for the woodland critters. I got back to my camp, started cleaning and drying, and probably didn't get to my dinner until one in the morning. I had caught two brook trout of reasonable size. I gutted them and let them hang in a bug net near the creek for the next day. I figured it was cold enough that they'd be okay. I got back to my little dinky tarp shelter around 3 a.m. and went inside, toweled off, and passed out. I awoke around 10 a.m. or so the next day and the woods were silent. I mean, no birds, no bugs. Wind in the branches, nearby brook gurgling, and that's it. Usually there's something. I decided to be cautious and go about my business. My camp was exactly as I had left it, except for two things. The first was there was a branch about two feet long, thick as a wrist, laid against the tree my pack was tied to. It had been gnawed, like by a beaver on both ends, which I've heard of but never seen before or since. It had no bark on it, but still was green wood. Had to have been left there, but to what end, 
I have no idea. Unsettling? Sure. Freaky? Not really. I wasn't scared. Actually, my first thought was I must have picked it up and forgotten about it. And so I put it out of my mind and went to collect my fish, which hopefully were still there and weren't rotten or nasty yet. I got into sight of them, or rather, the bug net they were in. They were gone. Bug net was loose, but intact. as the drawstring bag shaped kind. And empty. And both fish heads were still hanging in there. But the rest of the fish were gone. Okay. Probably another person then. Someone is giving me the Scooby-Doo treatment. I had a bunch of charcoal from the fire, and there was a nice big rock next to my fishing spot, so I scrawled on there. If you're hungry, come say hi, and I'll share my meal. With an arrow pointing roughly towards my camp. Grumpy more than unsettled now. I guess weird beaver branch is a trade for my fish? Hmm, whatever. I went to check on my drying shrooms and my berry cooler, and lo and behold, everything under the tarp is untouched. However, I hadn't swept out any of the debris beneath it. Why bother? Well, now there was no debris beneath my tarp, just straight dirt and rocks. Weird, again. I started looking more seriously for tracks and found nothing. Probably debris swept out from under my shelter was covering them. Screw it. Not here to play junior detective. I'm here to frolic in the woodlands and collect responsible amounts of treasured forgeables. Good God. I shake it off, go back to the creek to set my lines up again, and I notice my bells are gone. Okay. I couldn't remember if they had been there that morning or not. So, I assumed they were taken the previous night. I had only tied the rods to the tree after all. It was easy grabbing. I went back to my tarp, made some food and coffee, shook it off and went about my business. Now, here's the somewhat embarrassing thing. I know to make noise in the woods if bears came around, and I like to sing. This isn't the same as singing well or singing manly shanties and viking epic poems. This is, by and large, singing whatever had been playing on the speakers at my job. So, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Florence and the Machine, Lord, you get the picture. Also, I'm a bass. Whatever, don't judge me. Stuff is designed to be catchy. So, I went back on my rounds, and I found some fire morsels, or ash morsels, which are a very, really rare treat. I was really excited. There are hundreds of them, and it's super late for them to show up. They're my favorite morsels. I set about to collecting some and kept myself company by singing. All right. I was singing Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. I know. I got to the whoa, whoa, whoa part. If you've heard it, you know it. When I heard what sounded like someone harmonizing. Like I said, I'm a bass, but this was higher, tenor or alto, and muted by distance a little. It was also completely and undeniably wrong. Scratchy, gravelly, almost buzzy. Syllables weird and clipped and disjointed, and a little off-key and off-rhythm. Uncanny valley for sounds. I shut up immediately and froze, and it continued for a moment, and then stopped. I was experiencing a little bit of what my friends always call pucker butt and started to slowly reach back behind me for my Henry on its strap and I heard a single sudden yelp or bark or something and some rustling from somewhere uphill of me 
behind the tree line. I take a few breaths, assuming I had freaked the other party out as much as they did me and forced myself to relax. I keep small binos on me and I scan the tree line, but I didn't see anything. I thought, this is probably whoever took my fish. Probably someone squatting out here. I'm going to keep my head on a swivel some, but if they were going to be a problem, I feel like they already would have confronted me or taken a pot shot or something. It also occurred to me, finally, that I could have just been hearing some weird echo. That thought gave me a little more peace and calm than I had a few minutes before, although it didn't explain the yelp but normal animal activity does. Hooray rationalizing. I decide that that is enough morsels, and I do not want to be drying them after dark, so I head back to camp and get to making that happen. Am I an idiot? Maybe. I really didn't want to go home. I love wet weather. I've grown up in high deserts my whole life. And getting to really see some green that late in the year is such a treat. I wanted to stay. Creepy bullcrap be damned. I had had moments where my brain had tricked me before, and I talked myself into believing that it was happening again. I kept singing to myself more quietly than I was before. Yeah, see as titanium. And... It happens again. The weird, buzzy, higher voice joins in, again from a distance, and again I feel the bottom drop out of my stomach. I know this probably just sounds creepy because I thought I was alone, but it's hard to convey how off-sounding this was. It was fairly close to what I had been singing, but like it was coming out a culvert or something, and a few octaves higher, just as buzzy and clicky and hoarse sounding. If you've ever heard a tornado or a parrot talking or squeaking brakes or a train whistle, you'll get a sense of the qualities this voice had. It's a pitch a human can emulate with their throat, but the texture and shape of the sound aren't really how we sound like that. I was not having it at all. I shut up immediately again, and this time got the Henry off my back and looked around me. I figured this had to be somebody messing with me. Not unheard of for good foraging spots. Look up the fights over huckleberry patches if you don't believe me. But definitely my first time. Again, the singing continued for a moment after I stopped again from uphill and further in the woods, and definitely in a direction I hadn't gone yet. I called out, announced myself, and asked them to answer, please. Nothing. Tried again. Nothing. Silence again. And since I'm listening, I notice it again. Just wind in the trees and the creek. No animal noises. No bugs. My head had felt a little queasy, so I decided I needed to check the weather when I was sure I was going to get shot or something. Maybe a storm was rolling in. Bingo. I had headed over to a clearing, and for sure, a storm was rolling in. It's always hard to judge its speed, but it wasn't a bad idea to see about reconfiguring my tarp and having an early bedtime. Again, a little more at peace, since I figured any more bullcrap from my apparent neighbor is going to be less likely. I went back to my fishing rods, lucked out, and found I had caught a bigger trout than the night before. I gutted it, cooked it, and ate it on the spot. Those of you in the know know it's hard to beat. I collected some water for the next day, packed up my foraging stuff and lashed it all to trunk and decided to call it there before dusk was on its way in. 
I set up my tarp a little lower to the ground, more wind-resistant configuration, and set up a spare, older one, as a kind of rain fly over the entrance. It's worth noting that this was an old, lightweight, silver-colored, nylon backpacking tarp, fairly thin, set up facing the clearing, since likely the worst wind would be coming from there. It also pretty much blocked my view of the clearing. I did another Widowmaker check. All good. Made a hot cocoa and tucked in, just as it was starting to come down. And boy, did it come down hard. I had to put in some earplugs. Lightning was frequent and loud, and I didn't stay particularly dry and didn't get much sleep. It was, all in all, one of the most unpleasant and awe-inspiring nights I had had camping. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I thought I heard or felt something bounce off my tarp, kind of behind me. Well, not that weird. It happens in storms. I figured it was a branch. Then, a few minutes later, I see something. Maybe a stone, about the size of a plum, bounce off my tarp, off the rain fly and land in front of me. I get my headlamp turned on and sure as crap, it's a rock. Round, but not symmetrical or spherical and smooth, a river rock. Rocks don't fall off trees as a rule, and if this storm had picked one this round up, I should have been airborne. Then, another one a few minutes later. Similar trajectory. Then, nothing but the storm for a while. What am I going to do? Investigate and get soaked? I had my gun, and if crap was going to go down, I was about as ready as I could be. I turned my headlamp back off. I then got treated to pretty much the most awe-inspiring amount of lightning I have ever seen in my life. The sky is lit up for seconds at a time. The earplugs were not protecting me from the thunder, and my ears were ringing. I keep seeing the trees from the edge of the tree line and the clearing projected in shadow form onto my rain fly over and over again dancing this way and that. It was really beautiful, and if kind of inherently scary, also exhilarating. I really couldn't look away. Then, pretty clearly, I saw what looked like a person walking along the tree line, outlined against the trees and my rain fly by the lightning. They were walking weirdly, not running from cover to cover, but just kind of strolling a little unsteadily, like a drunk person. The silhouette wasn't bulky, and for some reason, I got the impression they weren't wearing clothes, or if they were, they were very, very tight, not like rain gear. They stopped, and whether or not they were facing me or the clearing, I couldn't tell you, but I felt watched, and very exposed. The figure stood, swaying a little, probably being pushed around by the winds, and just looked at whatever they were looking at. I got little glimpses here and there as the lightning flashed, and they didn't appear to be moving much. It was pretty freaky, and I didn't move except to get my gun in front of me. Then, I had another rock land on my tarp, bounce off and land in front of me. That was a bad moment. Lightning had stopped for a bit, and the thunder had died down for a moment. I had horrible, slow realization that I was very likely surrounded. Then, I heard cutting through the ringing in my ears, a momentary silence, clear as it had been earlier, but sounding much closer. The chorus from Titanium from behind my tarp. If you don't know the words, here they are. I'm bulletproof, nothing to lose. Fire away, fire away. Ricochet, you take your aim. Fire away, fire away. Then, nothing. 
I looked back towards the front and realized I didn't see that figure projected by the lightning anymore. Now that there was a lull in the lightning, I remember thinking, shit, 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 just over and over again. I basically was going to have to crawl out of my tarp to get on my feet, and there was pretty much no way I was going to stay in my shelter anymore. I counted down from ten and then pushed myself out and got to my feet. Henry in hand, and let out the loudest yell I could. I think I said something like, Knock it off, I'm armed. F off. I was not in a good headspace. I was about as freaked out as I had ever been up to this point. And this was not all that long after the deer thing I mentioned in the other story. I was about ready to crap myself. I looked around the back of my tent with my light and didn't see anything. Nobody. Just rain coming down. I looked around the front of my tarp. Nobody. I could clearly see into the clearing until my light got swallowed up by the rain. I walked around the edge of my little camp, sticking close to my tarps, and I didn't see anybody. I wished I could say I'd checked out the tree line for footsteps, but I didn't. I tried to yell again, and my voice was completely in my throat. Another rock hit my shelter and bounced off, squarely in the cone of my headlamp. And I won't lie to you all. I lost it. I fired my Henry into the dirt about ten feet in front of me, and I heard some immediate rustling in the woods, uphill for me again. I yelled some dumb panic bullcrap, and though F me if I know why, I ducked into my tarp again, wrapped up as much as I could, and huddled up with my gun. Eventually, the storm broke, followed by dawn, and I got up to pack up all my shit and get out of there. I was pretty shaky, and it took me a while to get my various gear all in hand and brought up to my shelter. I took a few moments to gather up the round river stones, and I noted I didn't see any like this even in the creek, and definitely none sitting around the ground. The debris is too thick. My shelter was the farthest back thing in the woods of the various stations around the camp, except for my pack, which had a garbage bag over it. When I went around to the back of the tarp to grab it, there were two more little sections of sapling green wood, chewed looking ends, barked stripped again, just like before, leaning against the trunk below it. Nope, not okay. It took me a second to go get my pack. I was that freaked out that I was now afraid of sticks. One my first night and two the second? Nope, F that. I finally got myself under control and went to grab my pack, and again, I had a powerful sense of being watched. I shook off the cover, packed it in a dry bag, and turned around to get my stakes out of the ground and pick up my tarp. There was a whole ripped open dead rabbit on the back edge of my tarp. The rain had washed off any blood that would have been on it, but the carcass was just splayed out there like it had landed on it after being thrown and then slid down the slope of it. It was fresh enough it didn't stink, and the digestive tract hadn't been punctured. I was instantly and totally numb. Mental dial tone. I picked it up with a stick, dropped it on my swamped-out fire pit, yanked my tarp out of the ground one stake at a time, balled it up, yanked my ring fly out of its lashings, hard enough to rip it, grabbed the rest of my crap, loosely shoveled it all in my pack, put my Henry so it hung in front of me, and power walked and jogged my way out of there until I couldn't anymore and breathlessly walked the rest of the way to my car. I got in, drove about 20 minutes, and then had to pull over to throw up a few times and have a panic attack. I have never been back there alone, and definitely not unarmed. Even then, 
I only went back in 2017. I still can't listen to that song without feeling sick. I know rationally that it was probably squatters or somebody up there messing with me, but the same question keeps coming up. Why didn't they need lights? When I was a theater study student in the Midlands of England, we had to take our little theater company on tour around the local rural countryside as part of a practical side of the course. Being a proper London girl, I wasn't best pleased with the prospect of roughing it in a 10-person van. There were 15 of us in the company. But for the sake of my art, I stopped being a silly tart and threw myself into it with enthusiasm. One day, we broke down in the middle of nowhere, and by the time the AA bloke got to us, and in turn, by the time we got to the campsite, all the spaces in the campsite had been taken. We had three performances locally the next day. It had gone 8 p.m., and it was almost pitch dark. We didn't have many options left open to us. Our director said it would be best if we drove the van into the near forest and all sleep in the van for the night. And as it was too late to continue driving around and having an early start the following day, we reluctantly agreed. We found a quiet part of the forest that was open with not many trees, and by 9.30, we were settled in the van, if a little cramped and cold. We were all 19 and 20 year olds and it was a big adventure. At around 11.30, I was stirred awake by one of my colleagues screaming and another bloke saying, this is so bad, we are so screwed. To my complete horror, through my sleep blurred eyes, I saw that our little van was completely surrounded by about 50 men, dressed in what appeared to be old-fashioned farming clothes, with homemade torches all burning brightly. I started panicking but didn't scream. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. They weren't moving an inch, didn't have any expression on their faces, not even when we beeped the horn at them. Two of the blokes even got out of the van and shouted at the men, to the total horror of everyone else. Nothing. Needless to say, we were all terrified. Every time we tried to move the van, the men moved a step forward. At 1.30, all the men suddenly just turned around and walked away through the trees. We were absolutely knackered, too tired to drive anywhere else so we took turns in keeping watch just in case the men came back. Thankfully, they never did. It's taking me years to work up the courage to write this story so that strangers could read it, because the events that took place all those years ago left me puzzled and frankly disturbed. It's perhaps best if I provide some background and context because it may help strengthen my story and people will hopefully believe me. I know that a lot of people claim to have a true story about strange encounters in the woods and I don't want people to accuse me of making this all up because honestly, I swear that this even really did happen. It's not supernatural it took place during the daytime and the monster is very much human. When I was approximately 13 or maybe 14 years old, somewhere between 2003-2004, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and my four younger siblings. We were not a very well-off family. In fact, we were quite poor. I never went on holidays abroad and would always go camping, usually to the same campsite which felt like miles away but 
was in reality less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We had been there a few times previously and knew the campsite and the surrounding area very well. It felt pretty safe and familiar. On this occasion, everything was going pretty normal. I hated camping. My parents would always argue when it came to putting up our tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets and showers, etc. It could be quite fun looking back and I do treasure the memories I have with my stepdad who is no longer with us. Usually, we would go on long hikes or bike rides, with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village, promising to get us all ice cream, which was a real treat as we never normally had it. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10 mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the smaller trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, were sat. It was hard work going on these epic long bike rides, but I'd rather enjoyed being in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nature. We weren't in the middle of nowhere, but it was remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads they weren't real roads paved with tarmac, more like dirt roads, which were really only suited for bicycles. During all the times we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down the roads. On this day, we were all cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sounds of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicle come past. There's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure as to why there's even a vehicle here. The vehicle passes us and we are expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle. You know, like a 4x4 pickup or Land Rover type of vehicle. But instead, we see an estate station wagon type of car with a long body and a large trunk with a window at the back. In the back of the station wagon, I see several large trash bags and it's a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons. One, this is not a car that is designed for going off roads in the woods. Two, as previously mentioned, we have never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before. Three, the person driving is clearly not lost as they didn't stop to ask for directions. Four, there are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point, they are full and tied up very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car and I didn't see anything poking out of the bag to indicate it was full of garbage. And five, the driver looked very rough, and I don't mean to sound rude, he looked very mean. I can't recall his features, just that he didn't look like a friendly person that belonged in the countryside. He wore dark clothing. I think he was clean shaven and had very short hair. I wish I remembered more about what this man looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger, what took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time as I write this story. My palms are getting very sweaty and my heart is racing. The car drives on several more feet. Then, the driver stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all just watching this car. My stepdad had told us to remain still. 
He's very serious as he's assessing the situation. Then, the car's reverse light comes on and the car starts reversing up to us. My stepdad, who was in the army for several years and was one of the toughest guys I knew, goes into full panic mode. He tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we all flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods until we find a railway bridge, which we had previously passed over. We never looked back. I have no idea if the man in the car got out to go after us. I don't know if he just continued driving. I have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. We never really spoke about what happened that day. I know it was something that seriously scarred my dad because of his response. And I'm left frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. I work as a child care professional and one of the kids that I look after had recently gotten into hiking. I decided to take him to a really cool trail in Salt Fork State Park. We were all set to hike to Hossack's Cave after parking right near the beginning of the trailhead. The entire trail is about half of a mile, which is why I chose this trail for our hike that day. I also chose this trail because any time that I had been on it before, it was very busy and full of people and a very popular spot which made me feel secure. However, this past summer we had a cluster of severe summer storms which caused massive damage to the trail, so to my surprise it was much more difficult and completely empty. I wasn't bothered by the trail being obviously empty because there was a small construction crew working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot wide, with a six to 12 foot drop off into a creek bed that is solid rock and several trees down. He is very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was, and he was so excited to tackle our adventure. We made it all the way to a platform that allows you to see the entire cave. There were many downed trees surrounding the platform, and it was actually closed at this point, but we had made it this far, so we decided to maneuver around the platform and proceeded the few hundred feet into the cave. We spent the most time in the area due to the difficulty, so I know exactly what it looked like. There were tree roots directly under the platform, and you could climb down either side of them. It is also worth noting that Hossack's cave is much more like a cliff than an overhanging rock formation, and a trickle of a waterfall directly in the middle. It is not a creepy closed-up cave. It is very open and beautiful. We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently, but had been at some point sitting on a large rock that had a heart carved into it. I chalked it up to someone having a date or something and disregarded it. He wanted to climb to the top, where I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that had been stacked up by somebody. I definitely felt weird at this point but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. It was the happiest that I had seen him in a very long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was time to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. We finally decided to leave, and when we got to the platform, dead center in the middle of the tree roots, was a wet washcloth hanging that was absolutely not there before. He noticed it as well, but did not pick up on the severity of the situation that we were in. At that moment, I factually knew two things. One, someone was watching us and we did not see them. And two, 
they were now potentially hiding in the woods and made it a point to not be seen, but to leave an object to be noticed. There was no running back with the narrow trail, and I was not about to tell him that we were in potential danger. I told him to go in front of me, and I just kept encouraging him that he was doing great over and over, and that seemed to speed him up naturally. I never saw anyone while we were on the trail. We got to the car, and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a very dirty man, probably in his thirties, came out of the woods and made it a point to stare at me with the most empty of expressions that I have ever seen. The man followed me with his eyes and head as I drove by him and continued to stare at me until I couldn't see him anymore. I knew the third fact at that point. He made it a point to make himself apparent to me, and that facts one and two were true. That stare stuck with me for days, and I considered counseling after this as it bothered me for several weeks causing me severe anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, the crazy looking man had ample time to do anything that he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I just could not in any way rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way that he did if he wanted to go unnoticed. Deep down, I know that it is much more likely that it was a deliberate action intended to scare me. He never had any idea how panicked I was, and to this day, it is the most fun that I have ever seen him have. He brings it up regularly, and it was a very positive experience for him. It was one of my worst experiences ever, and it made me feel so sick and disturbed. I will never ever take that trail again. So, this experience occurred back in October 2014, and I've been searching the internet for answers and explanations ever since. Myself and my friends present at the time had told just about everyone we know about this, Reception has been mixed between believing us and not believing us around 50-50, including some accounts, similar experiences in those same woods from some of the people we told. Let me give you a little background info on what happened first. These events took place in the Hell's Hollow area of McConnell's Mill State Park in western Pennsylvania. My friends and I would often meet up in the park after dark, walk back off the trail a little where we'd sometimes hang out or to smoke. Most of us had just finished college and hadn't moved out from our parents' houses yet, so we didn't have a place of our own to hang out just yet. Hell's Hollow became that place as we'd been hanging out in those woods since we were 14 or so. I have always felt safe and comfortable in those woods. I've grown to know every inch of these woods. My friends and I hiked every trail, fished every stream, and even camped out there on multiple occasions. I'll bet, not quite legal, but we would hike so many miles out that we were confident no morning hikers or DCNR would be out there that early to discover us before we had packed up and broke camp. But I was terrified to step into those woods for a few years after this happened, and when I did, I was pretty reluctant to go out past sunset, which came early in that gorge. So, here we are, mid-October 2014, which was all of our favorite month to be out there due to the beauty of the park in the fall. It was around 11 p.m. Myself and three of my best friends, who out of respect for their privacies online, will just label S, N, and L. One male and two female friends. 
part of our core group of about a dozen or so friends were walking back into the woods to chill and shoot the shit. We met up in the parking lot of Hell's Hollow and walked about 100 to 150 yards into the woods, crossing all three bridges over the creek following the waterfall trail, which is much shorter than the nearly eight mile long slippery rock gorge trail. We'd gotten back near the waterfall and just started hanging out and catching up on what we'd been all up to that week, as we usually did. Suddenly, I got a weird sense of fear. It felt not so much something was watching me, but that I was being stalked by something. I brought this up to my friends. Both S and N said they felt the same feeling. L said she didn't and still hadn't, even though the other three of us had gone super silent. I'll never forget that feeling and what happened immediately after for the rest of my life. I just made a comment about how I didn't feel safe out in those woods for the first time in my life. I was about to suggest we leave right away when we heard a large branch crashing in the trees nearby. And this thing was branch or treetop that came down was huge. The sound it made sounded like an entire tree coming down through the canopy. We all absolutely froze in place. That's when we noticed one of the scariest things about the ordeal. The woods had gone absolutely silent. No insects, birds, or owls. No wind. Hell, we all swear we couldn't even hear the nearby waterfall anymore. All these sounds normally were quite audible every other night. Nobody had a real flashlight. I told everyone to get back to back so we'd all four be looking in a different direction. We turned our dim cell phone flashlights on and started looking around. They didn't provide a whole lot of light, so our view was pretty limited. My heart was beating through the roof, and I can honestly say, without a shadow of a doubt, that this was the most scared I had ever been in my entire life. To this day, it was silent for about a minute, before we heard something moving in the trees above us. We'd all shined our lights in the direction it came from, but would only see large tree limbs rocking as though something big had been up there. Not a single one of us had gotten a look at what it was. This continued happening for another few minutes in a few different locations around us before we realized that whatever this was, was circling us. Then came a very loud and unsettling growling sound. I told everyone to run, and so we did. We all ran as fast as we could, keeping up with each other pretty well as we were all running for our lives. We continued to hear the sounds of treetops moving nearby while we were running, and I knew right away this was chasing us. I was too scared to even scream, even though I wanted to. The thing chased us, until we crossed the second bridge, about 50 yards or so from the parking lot, before we stopped hearing the noises. We all got back to our cars and hopped in them. Nobody had said anything besides, run, or go, go, go. Yet even as we were getting in the car, when S screamed, meet back at my house, We peeled out of that parking lot so fast that you could see our tire tracks for years. Almost the entire trip back to S's house was down back roads surrounded by woods on either side. So, needless to say, I was still in absolute panic the entire way back. I was thinking to myself, there's no way that just happened, but it absolutely just did. It really did feel like something out of a horror movie, but I was terrified that whatever that was wasn't finished with us yet. 
I was waiting for it to come flying out of the woods in front of me or jump on the roof of my car. When we all got back to S's house, we were all still pretty shaken up. We all went inside and were greeted by S's mom. We all hysterically told her what had just happened to us. She doubted it as she is quite a skeptical and very intelligent woman. Even when we swore on our lives that it was something completely unexplainable, she proposed various logical answers. Explanations that included a large owl, birds, or bear. Though, none of those explained this. No bird was that big, and I've never seen a bear hop from treetop to treetop, like Tarzan or something. Have you? Eventually, she laughed and said, well, maybe a monkey escaped from the Living Treasures Animal Park, which was about 10 miles away before she went to bed. My friends and I hung out for another couple hours, nervously smoking cigarettes and going over what had happened over and over again. Eventually, we calmed down enough to feel safe driving home. I still love those woods and venture into them to take my family on hikes and to fish with my friends but always remembering what happened. I still cannot explain it, and no answers I've researched online have satisfied me. People both online and in person had suggested it was a Wendigo or something. We even heard other stories from locals similar to ours. About two months later, another one of my best friends who wasn't there for the first encounter said that he glimpsed what looked like was a skinny, naked guy crawling around back there with almost translucent white skin that caught the moonlight before he lost sight of it and ran out of there. We had a few other experiences, but I won't go into detail about those in this story. I've already typed enough in this one, but I'd really love to hear from others who may have had this happen to them in Hell's Hollow, McConnell's Mill State Park, I swear on my life until the day I die that this occurred not just once, but on at least two other occasions in the next two years to follow. We have all since about 2016 never experienced anything out of the ordinary in those woods again, which just adds to the mystery. Take my story for what you will. A lot of people don't believe us, but... There are also many I know will know exactly what we went through. I ask of anyone who can relate or even give me possible answers to please reach out to me. What in the hell was in those woods? I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years and still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. I apologize for how long it is. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was approximately six miles out and back, moderate difficulty hike, with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out some time after noon. At first, we took it slow and 
meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone, and we mused over what we thought it might be. It was clearly a vertebrae from a large animal, but we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife and take pictures of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit so I always knew how many miles we traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner, Michael, slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprise scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so he wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace. But when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we'd already traveled away at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail, but it wasn't. We went another half mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What in the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead. 
and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all too familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail and well-maintained too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have any service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had a little daylight left. We were almost out of water, had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were all alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, except for the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That was impossible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we'd hiked nine total miles. After 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled towards it. Relief didn't completely wash over me, though because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along side of the road for a few miles more. There was simply no way this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, 
thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved. I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Like your legs just won't cooperate and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and pill out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone that I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. Every year, my friends and I go on a week-long canoe trip in Algonquin Park, usually to drink and fish. This past summer, we had decided to stay on Tom Thompson Lake, if you know it, for our main site, which ended up being on an island in the middle of the lake. There were six of us in total, with one group of four in a large tent, one guy in a solo tent, and myself in a hammock between them. One night, we had been huddled around the fire at about 1 a.m. when we noticed a flare in the sky over what we assumed was an adjacent lake. We didn't think much of it until an awful scream came across the lake about 20 minutes later. I was the only one left sober at this time, and there wasn't much we could do, so we assumed it was the problem bare in the area we'd been warned of at the outfitters. The strange part came after everyone had gone to bed. At 4 a.m., the other five guys went to their tents and passed out, while I lay in my hammock listening to them fall asleep. For reference, the group of four were about 30 feet to my right, and the other guy about 100 feet to my left, on the far shore. As I watched the stars and tried to will myself to sleep, I noticed everything had gone incredibly silent. Suddenly feeling creeped out, I slowed my breathing and stayed as still as I could, thinking about the possible bear and how I was a neatly wrapped meat sack hanging there. Then I heard a voice call out about 20 feet to my left by the remains of our fire. It was the voice of my friend Seamus, who was one of the guys passed out in the large tent. Four hellos, with each one sounding more emotionless. Hello? 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 All said within maybe six seconds. Although I immediately recognized his voice, every instinct I had was on alert, telling me not to respond. I stayed as quiet as a corpse for the next five minutes listening for any movement, until I felt the tension leave the air. It disturbed me a lot to know how normally you can hear every movement in the sight, and yet I heard absolutely nothing. The next morning, everyone told me they'd heard nothing, but we agreed to move sights early, 
since we'd all gotten an eerie vibe from that night. That was our sixth trip to Algonquin, and we've never had any creepy experiences before. I hope that what I heard that night was a camper, with an identical voice to my friend, who had come to see if the site was free, or Seamus had somehow quietly slept walk out of his tent, but neither seems possible. I 100% would have heard them moving. Anyways, I can only hope nothing happens on in future trips, but it will be hard to forget the fear of that event. I love camping. I try to go every summer. My family has a little cabin on Moxie Pond, right on the water. It's a couple hundred miles headed northwest, and then about ten miles down the old logging roads to get to our spot. I love it. It's trees and water and no neighbors to be seen. It's quiet, unless the dickhead across the pond is running his generator all damn day. There's no power. It's gas lights and stove. No plumbing, no running water other than what you pump from the lake using the old-fashioned hand pump over the sink. You do your business in the outhouse and throw some cedar shavings on it as a courtesy to the next person. Me and my girlfriend have been together for about two years. She's more from the city, but she was excited to come with when I said I wanted to go up to camp this year. We couldn't go last year, so we packed our clothes and food and whatnot into my trunk and started up. It's about a four hour drive, about an hour and a half on the highway until you get to Shohagen, and then it's another couple hours driving through tiny towns that are trapped in yesteryear and falling apart. The further you get from the paper mill, the worse it looks, but the better it smells. Driving by the paper mill smells like a wet skunk fart. You'll eventually get up into the mountains. The views are amazing. Sometimes some mass hole will give you plenty of time to admire them as you're trapped behind their bumper as they creep along. You eventually get to the forks. The forks contain Barry's General Store whitewater rafting companies, and not much else. We got up there closer to the end of twilight, so there was nothing going on, and no people out. You take a right, drive to the dam at the end of the lake, take a left, and you're on the logging roads. You have to go kind of slow on the logging roads. I almost kissed a young moose one year when it jumped out right beside my truck its nose almost coming through my open window. You're surrounded by nothing but trees. The forest is so thick, you can't really see past the first trees, especially at night. I've had some weird things happen up here over the years. I've heard a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night that sounded like a girl getting murdered. The next day, I found a half-eaten rabbit floating in the lake. That put my mind at ease. A rabbit can scream, and it'll sound just like a little girl. I've heard singing in the woods, away from the direction of any other camps. It was a beautiful, mournful song, and I didn't understand the language. That's a different story, though. I digress. We're driving down the logging roads, and I'm quietly laughing to myself as my girlfriend clutches my arm tightly, her eyes wide. She occasionally punches my leg when I don't stifle myself well enough. I don't blame her for being scared. She's never been in woods like this before. But I warned her. And it was her fault we got such a late start anyway. So we have to drive in at night. Once you get closer to the lake, the trails get smaller and more overgrown. Birch trees, bent over from years of snow and wind, scrape their branches over the top of the truck, occasionally blocking my vision. There's always maintenance to be done. 
I'm used to my eyes playing tricks on me, so I didn't think anything of seeing the shadows moving around us. I just wrote it off as being a trick of the light as the front of my truck bounced on the wretched road. My girlfriend would occasionally gasp and whimper and say, What the F is that? as the shadows played around us. Finally, I just had her put her head in my lap and I played with her hair as I drove, constantly telling myself that the figures and shapes I see are just trees and shadow. This isn't my first time doing this. I get a little turned around in the dark, but we get to camp okay. I let her put her head back up and I take her in my arms and comfort her before we got out, telling her that nothing weird has ever happened up here. It's a lie, but I only have to get her out of the truck and into the camp. I grab my flashlight and get out and walk over to her door. I open it for her, grab her bag, and walk her into the camp. I get the gas going and turn the lights on, sit her down in the comfy chair, hand her her book, and go to get the rest of the stuff out of the truck. We're moved in and I make us dinner while she reads. Safe inside, she's calmer now. But she did have me close. But she did have me close the blinds to the double slider at the front of the camp. I was going to anyway. During the day, it's a wonderful view of the lake. But at night, the fear is always at the back of my mind that I'm going to look out them and see something standing on the porch looking in. We eat, we enjoy the privacy and each other, and we go to bed. We stay in the camp for a couple days. There's nothing that needs doing. We read, we swim, we have our private time. We take the kayaks out and visit the islands. I tried to get her to just be naked while we're alone up here, but no luck. I brought a tent because I'd like to spend a night right out in the woods, but it's hard to convince her at first. But after a couple nights spent drinking by the fire without anything weird happening, she's more inclined to try it. As long as I bring my shotgun, which I was going to do anyway. I've never had an encounter with a bear or wolves up here, and we didn't hear any howling, but I'm not staying in the woods unarmed. It's the third or fourth night when we go out. We don't go far, because I know better than to just wander off into the woods. We stay in sight of the big tree beside camp. We can't see the camp. We can't hear the water. But we find a nice flat spot in a small clearing, and I put the tent up. You can probably imagine how we then spent the rest of the day. We had hot dogs and s'mores over the fire that night. And then I put the fire out and we staggered to bed. She fell asleep quickly. I didn't sleep so well. I feel like I was in and out all night and more caught in the in-between world than actually asleep. I felt her get up and saw the muted light from her hand covering the flashlight, but I couldn't react or say anything. I'm not sure I didn't dream it. She went out, and after a minute, she came back in with the light off. She laid down and was out again. I still couldn't move, so again, I'm not sure I didn't dream her going out. My dreams are generally this not exciting, but I know I woke up when I heard her voice from outside the tent, her face on the other side of the fabric, a desperate and terrified whisper. You need to get out of there. That's not me. Get out. We need to get back inside the camp. My blood ran cold and my eyes opened. At least I think they were open. I couldn't see a thing. I sat up and went to reach for my shotgun just in case. But I felt her hands wrap around me and gently pull me back down. She whispered, Where are you going? And I just froze. I let her pull me back down as my mind raced. My thoughts were like a broken mirror, 
tumbling around in a dryer, smashing into each other and splintering even more. I said nothing. I just laid down and listened. My girlfriend still had her hands lightly across my chest, and she seemed to have fallen asleep again. I laid there in the dark, straining to hear anything other than her breathing. There was nothing. I had to chalk it up to dreaming, but I also had to look before I could go to sleep. I started to get up again, but again, she pulled me down and got on top of me, aggressively kissing me. She didn't go to bed naked. She always wears pajamas. She wore some light blue PJ pants and one of my shirts to bed. But they're gone now, though. I wear nothing to bed, so it was easy for her to get what she was after. It's exceedingly rare for her to initiate. That's almost always been my job. She's always an eager participant, but I think this was maybe the third time in two years that she initiated herself. And she put herself on top. And she was aggressive. I'm not complaining about not having to do the work or the enthusiasm. But all three together is like finding a unicorn. A freaking unicorn. As she did her thing, I eventually put what happened out of my mind and finally got my head in the game, thanking the alcohol. After we finished, she immediately got up and went outside. I figured she just had to pee, but she didn't bring a light. She never just gets up right after. We always just lay there for a while. She left the flap open. I'm sure because she was coming right back. I noticed I couldn't hear anything at all. Not that I was trying to hear her pee. I just figured that she wouldn't be concerned about it and go too far from the tent in the dark. After a couple minutes, I heard her footsteps returning. She came through the flap and was already on her way to laying down before her feet were inside. I followed the sound and caught her in my arms. She was dressed again. I was going to ask her why she left her clothes outside, but she was asleep by the time her head hit my chest. I kissed her forehead and rolled her off me so I could zip up the tent flap. Then I lay down, absolutely exhausted. And at some point, I fell asleep while listening to the absolutely nothing going on in the woods around us. I thought it strange, but I just figured it was because we were out here. The next morning, I made pancakes and bacon over the fire for us. I mentioned the happenings last night, and she just looked at me quizzically. She couldn't remember any of it. She only remembered waking up to pee, taking the light, and then just going back to the tent and crashing again. She's not superstitious, so she just blamed the alcohol and was happy that she made me happy, and that was that. After breakfast, I started to break down the camp. I packed up things for her to take back, pointed out the tree by the camp, and sent her on her way. I watched her walk away for a minute, because I just enjoy watching my girlfriend walking away. She disappeared into the woods, and I set about breaking the tent down and getting it packed up. It went slower than I would have liked. You have to get everything just right if it's going to fit in its respective bags again. After struggling for a bit and scratching my head, I became aware that I wasn't alone. I turned around and there was my girlfriend just looking at me. In broad daylight, she was naked again. My eyes lit up and she giggled at my face. Then crossed the distance to me without a word. She used the roll-up tent to kneel on for about 20 minutes, then just got up and walked off in the direction of camp. I'll admit, I was starting to have a hard time keeping up with her. Not that I was complaining, but I was feeling exhausted after every time. I finally got everything put away and went back to camp. I sat down and read for a little while before finally succumbing to a nap. 
sitting in the comfy chair in the sunlight, facing out the sliders. I woke up to my girlfriend getting touchy after me again. When we were done, I immediately passed out. I woke up some time in the mid-afternoon to wind and rain. I'm not sure when. We don't have a clock at camp. My girlfriend had moved to the couch, reading. She was in just her underwear. I didn't know what prompted this change in dress code and appetite. I thought it was weird, but I was also happy about it. I started picking things up as we were leaving the next morning. I went in the bedroom to gather any clothes. Her blue pajama pants and my shirt weren't anywhere to be seen. I asked about them and she said they were already packed. I went outside to take a leak. The winds were getting stronger now and occasional fat raindrops would slap against my body. I could just barely hear my girlfriend calling my name, so I shook it off and went back inside to find out what she wanted. She was still sitting on the couch, reading. I asked if she was calling for me. She just looked up and shook her head. I reminded myself that sometimes my imagination gets the better of me and just put it out of my mind. That night, she didn't let me go right to sleep, but I crashed hard after. I woke up with a mild headache early in the morning. I had to pee again. I turned on my flashlight and covered it leaving just a sliver of light. My girlfriend sat up and looked at me, so I turned the light towards her. Her eyes looked white and cloudy. I uncovered the light and she blinked from the brightness, and her eyes were back to normal. She cursed me for blasting her in the face with the light, and I apologized. I told her what I was doing and to just go back to sleep. She told me to hurry back, The storm had passed. I walked outside to the tree line. I shined the light through the trees while I relieved myself, just in case. The beam fell upon a patch of upset earth, all scratched and dug up. It wasn't far into the woods, so I walked over to it. Something had obviously gotten eaten. There was blood everywhere. I couldn't really make out any tracks. It just looked like there was a lot of thrashing and kicking involved. But it was weird that there wasn't a carcass. And it was weird it had happened so close to camp. If the body had been dragged off into the woods, I wasn't going to go looking for it. The next morning, we got ready to go and headed out. We talked about the weekend, but she seemed to have a spotty memory of it. I didn't think she had that much to drink. She kept herself entertained with me for most of the ride home. She'd never done that before, even when I asked for it. I was finally starting to think with the head attached to my shoulders. Her personality was different, at least when it came to sex. But aside from that, she still acted like she always had. I wasn't sure what to think. All she would say when I'd ask why she wasn't nearly as inhibited anymore was, I got over it, delivered with a shrug and a smile. It's been a few months now, and her appetite is still high. I'm having a harder and harder time keeping up with her. I'm just getting tired more often. I've noticed I'm getting white hairs, and I just feel older. I talked to my doctor about it, but I can't afford that. I try to tell her I'm tired, but she always brings it out of me, and then I crash immediately after, and she always seems to have more and more energy. I don't know if I can keep doing this. I couldn't even write this in peace. Does anyone have any idea what's going on? And does anyone know what? could have possibly happened to my girlfriend on that camping trip? Something that has always sparked an interest, if you will, are disappearances that happened in the woods, forests, while camping, and 
hiking. Several months back, there was an incident on the Appalachian Trail with a man who happens to be from my area in Massachusetts. Jordan, who went by the name Sovereign, faces federal charges of murder within the special maritime territorial jurisdiction of the United States and assault with the intent to murder within the special maritime territorial jurisdiction of the United States in the deadly May 11th attack, which left one hiker dead and another severely injured. Authorities said Jordan was known by hikers as a suspicious person through social media. Michael Hensley, sheriff in Unicoi County, Tennessee, issued a warning in April about Sovereign, who he said threatened hikers on the Appalachian Trailhead in Tennessee and in Madison County, North Carolina. The man brandished a knife and a machete at hikers and traveled with a dog, according to Hensley. According to an affidavit filed in the U.S. District Court in Abington, Virginia, Jordan approached four hikers Friday night and was acting disturbed and unstable. When the hikers made camp on the trail in Wythe County, Jordan approached their tents, threatening to pour gasoline on their tents and burn them to death, authorities said. The group attempted to leave the campsite, but Jordan approached them with a knife, according to the affidavit. Two of the hikers fled, and Jordan chased after them, but later returned to the campsite to find the remaining hikers, authorities said. He began arguing with one of the hikers before stabbing the man in the upper part of the body, the other hiker told police. She ran from Jordan and raised her arms as if to surrender when he caught up with her, according to court dockets. The woman was stabbed multiple times and played dead while Jordan left to look for his dog, the affidavit said. Police received an emergency call around 2.30 a.m. from a man and woman who authorities believe are the hikers who fled Jordan at the campsite. A second call came in about 45 minutes later from the woman who played dead, according to authorities. She ran into a man and woman hiking the trail who helped her walk to call 911, police said. Authorities found a man dead at the scene of the attack and a knife near his body. He was identified as 43-year-old Ronald S. Sanchez Jr. of Oklahoma. Stories like these are often eerie and usually very isolated. Do you or does anyone else know of unresolved cases of people who have gone missing from the woods? And that, dear listeners, is the end of these true, backwood, creepy stories. I hope that you are resting well and Slumberland is treating you kindly. Until next time, I'll read to you soon.